Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the singing of our national anthem. Brexit means Brexit. My administration has accomplished more than almost any administration in the history of our country. Hi, hello and welcome. My name is Royfield Brown and I am in London. Of course I am, you can tell by the background. Uh, in this episode of the Mid-Atlantic Podcast, where history comes alive, so my notes say, um, we're going to try and understand w- one of the key elements to the current war between Israel and Hamas, which is the Six Days War. In this episode, we're going to dive deep into the Moultrous period in 1967 and its aftermath, which is... As according to many Palestinian thinkers, they refer to it as a second Nakba. We're honoured again to have with us Benny Morris, the renowned Israeli historian. Morris's deep insights will guide us through this complex maze of events and their long lasting impact on Israel and the Palestinian community. Also joining us, we have a good friend of mine, uh, Mitchell Newmark, who's an associate professor in the history department of the College of Arts and Letters in um, Sacramento, and he got his history PhD from UCLA. Now, Mitch um, is is disabled, so um, uh, we're really happy to have him with us. Uh, he had, uh, unfortunately, a, a, a medical mishap, but Mitch is with us, and um, and, it, and, it's, and it's really important uh, for me personally that Mitch is also part of this conversation. And now, before we dive uh, really into this episode, please For the love of all things holy, I say this on every episode, uh, dear listeners, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. This is on YouTube as well as a podcast. Also, if you go over to Royfield.com and hit sign up, which is over on the top right, you can join our newsletter. This is your golden ticket to get the Zoom link so you can actually be part of this conversation. So it means that you can actually not only watch it live, but then also ask a question to the participants uh, who I'm interviewing. And it helps us to have a vibrant community. So, uh, the, so Professor Benny Morris, um, how are you, and how have you been since we last spoke? I'm okay. You know what? I, I I love you. You're always a man of man of few words when I ask you. Um, how how are you doing now? Now, Mitch, um, I I I can physically see um that you have to be reclined. But all things considered, how have you been doing recently, sir? Before we we start with the show. Well, without getting into too much details, it's been really tough for me, and uh, I just have to correct you. I'm I'm now professor emeritus of history uh, because I had to disability retire uh, because of the injury I had from the surgery, which has has led to more surgeries. I have a number of surgeries I need to go through to become more independent, and uh, and um, to the point where I can be fully reinstated and begin teaching again. It's going to be a long, hard struggle. I'm I'm so happy and lucky to have the opportunity not only to speak to you, Royfield, but also to Benny Morris. I mean, who is an outstanding, uh, he didn't pay me, but he's an outstanding historian. So it's 1967, uh, Benny, and there are tensions in the Middle East. Before Israel launches that attack on uh, those uh, Egyptian air bases. What are the tensions? Why why does Israel feel that it needs to have this preemptive strike on Egypt? Well, there's a, a there's a long haul and there's a an immediate um, a set of circumstances. The long haul, to put it very short, in in short, the Arab world after 1948 opposed Israel's existence boycotted the country completely, had nothing to do with it, and uh, at least uh, rhetorically uh, remained hostile to Israel, even not calling the country Israel. Uh, In the early 60s, uh, two two sets of um, uh, uh, circumstances led to increased tension between Israel and the Arab states, especially uh, Syria. One was the birth of the Palestinian, what they call the resistance movement, what Israel calls uh, uh, the terrorist movements, 
the Fatah movement under Arafat emerged at the end of the 1950s and began operating in 1965, launching small raids into Italy, into Israel, sorry, a guerrilla raids, terrorist raids, whatever you want to call it, killing, a, a, killing a, a farmers here and there, trying to blow up one or two installations and so on. That's from 1965. Slightly before that, and they were they were patroned um, and um, uh, organized in some fashion, certainly supported, aided, um, uh, trained by Syria. Now, a in a few years before that, in the early 60s, the Syrians began to divert or attempted to divert the headwaters of the Jordan River so that Israel would have less benefit of water from the Jordan River and from the lake, Lake Tiberias or the Lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, uh, to which the Jordan flows. Um, so they began to divert the the um, uh, the water, um, and Israel um, uh, attacked the diversion machinery, the tools, and so on. And there were also um, uh, there was tension along the border. Israeli farmers were farming up to the international um, frontier. The Syrians didn't like it. They said some of the territory shouldn't be uh, under Israeli um, uh, either occupation or usage and um, began to shoot at farmers um, uh, in their tractors and so on. Inhabitants of an Israeli border village return to their jobs as the newest Middle East crisis seems to be easing slightly. But the scars are still fresh. Israeli soldiers march in somber funeral procession for a comrade killed by Syrian shelling. The fighting occurred in the demilitarized zone southeast of the Sea of Galilee. In reprisal against Syrian fire, Israeli troops leveled an Arab village. And, and so border clashes developed between Israel and Syria um, in the early 60s uh, because of these two things, or three things. The, the Palestinian guerrillas operating, not necessarily out of Syrian territory, but organized out of Syria, usually sent through Lebanon and Jordan to attack Israel, and the Syrians themselves doing the diversion of the water uh, of the of the Jordan River and um, attacking farmers along the international frontier. These caused tensions. These tensions built up into the mid sixties, um, and some major clashes followed between Israel and the Syrian army, in which Israel downed a number of Syrian jets, um, bombarded some Syrian positions, and this. Uh, led to the immediate circumstances leading to the war. If you want, I can go into that as well. Uh, let, 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 let's do that, but let's have a, a little bit more framing. Um, it's also kind of Im important that, um, as you've said, that the PLO starts in 1964. We have FATA, which is a little time beforehand. But by by this time, we do have the start of a kind of a Palestinian identity, don't we? That um, previously the people who would call themselves Arabs or Palestinian Arabs see themselves as, as Palestinian um, as a way of uh, the, um, as a way of identification. That's kind of important in terms of growing a, a kind of national consciousness for the Palestinian people. Yeah, well, the, the, this is a process which began in the 1920s. By the 1940s, Arabs living in Palestine, many of them, began to see themselves and call themselves Palestinian Arabs, as, a, as a differentiated from Syrian Arabs or Jordanian Arabs. They began to see themselves as a separate national group uh, emerging and with a desire for self-determination. So th this begins, as I say, very slowly in the 20s, reaches some sort of peak in 48 with the first uh, the, the, the first Israeli Arab war, uh, basically triggered by Palestinian antagonism to Israel's um, emergence. And uh, Mitch, a question for you, just, just, just very briefly, as briefly as you can, because I do want to get on to the war and then its aftermath. But could you explain for us the difference between the Palestinians who are living in Gaza under Egyptian rule and uh, the Palestinians on the West Bank, um, which is obviously is part of the Jordanian kingdom? Uh, tell us why the two situations are different. Uh, well, this actually relates to the question that you mentioned to Benny. And Benny, of course, is the expert. I'm just a dilettante. Um, 
Um, but I think first, the extent in which um, there is an Arab national movement, it still exists in the world. Um, and, um, you know, before I get into the specifics, uh, we can't forget that early in the 60s, there was an attempt to unify the Arab world, to become one state, where Syria essentially merged into Egypt with part of southern Lebanon. I'm sorry, with part of of Yemen. Yemen. Um, yeah. And and at the time, Yemen had 60,000 troops uh, in a civil war. I'm sorry, Egypt had 60,000 troops in a civil war in Yemen. But this is one of the conflicting and interesting features. And I'll bring in the Palestinians in a second, but it's hard to understand because essentially since the mandate period, and particularly after the mandate period, you had a period of state building in which these brand new states you know, to some hard artificially created uh, in the aftermath of the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the victories of the supreme allied powers, in which you become, you see people becoming more Iraqi or more Lebanese or more Jordanian uh, as the decades flow, because these states are teaching about their nation. And so they have to imagine a past. At the same time, of course, you have the Palestinian issue. And in the aftermath of the decline of Syria uh, and the great Syrian kingdom, uh, because the French defeated the Syrians at the Battle of Mycelune in, in 1920, um, you see the Palestinians um, thinking that they are, by definition, in a different political entity once you get to the mandate period. And with the fall of this supposedly unified greater Syrian Arab kingdom, you begin to see alternatives and you begin to see Palestinians in 1920. I think uh, it is uh, um, you begin Palestinians are arguing we are Palestinian Arabs. But the uh, the uh, the war of independence and the Nakba. It's sort of like the exodus for the Jewish people. It's one of those great events that creates a Palestinian nation. And of course, in the aftermath of 1948, 1949, in the War of Independence, what Konstantin Zarek, the uh, 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 Arab intellectual, wrote a book called The Manat al Nakba, The um, Meaning of the Disaster. And his conclusions is, is that the Arab people, like other people, like Musa Alami at the time, were not united. But ironically, at the same time, you have these Arab states becoming more homogeneous, more different. Now, the Palestinian refugees uh, face different uh, uh, situations where they go. In Lebanon, they are stuck, even though some may be 10 miles from where they previously lived, or 20 miles in a culture that was part of the same political unit before the British conquest, that is the Velayat or region of Beirut, uh, they are not allowed to become Arab citizens. Um, in Egypt, uh, they are not allowed to become Egyptian citizens. And I think for the first year, I, th I think, and Benny Morris may correct me on this, that Haj Amin al-Husseini, who was with the Egyptians, more against the Jordanians and the Hashemites, sort of declared a, a, a pseudo-independent Palestine. But, but the Egyptians essentially took colonial control over Gaza and ruled Gaza as sort of as a separate colony, essentially. And Jordan was distinct out of all the Arab nations. Jordan, uh, of course, annexed the West Bank, and the people who are living in this West Bank became Jordanian citizens. And in fact, the name of the kingdom, what was hitherto the kingdom of Transjordan, became the kingdom of Jordan because it was the both sides of the border. In fact, it could have been called, renamed the kingdom of Palestine, which was on both sides of the border of the River Jordan. So Palestinians in um, Gaza, um, don't have citizenship. They're not actually right. Egyptian. Uh, they're left in this kind of stateless limbo. But over on what we now call the West Bank, 
they are full fully Jordanian citizens. Um, right. So there, there is so there's, so there's a key difference there. Um, one minute there, Mitch. Uh, Benny, I just want to come to you before we really do launch into that Israeli preemptive strike, that strike which is going to down the Egyptian air force in the morning. Um, who was prime minister of Israel at the time? Um, t- tell us about the politics of Israel um, outside of the tensions in the Middle East, and then we'll go into uh, June 1947, uh, 1967. Sorry. In, in 1935, I hate going backwards, but we have to. In 1935, the labor movement in Israel, what's equivalent to the Labour Party in England, Mapai, and it's a left-wing ally, what became Mapam, um, dominated the Zionist um, movement and the Zionist enterprise in Palestine from 1935. They are the ones who led uh, the the Jews in Palestine into statehood in 1948 and to victory over the Arab states, the Palestinian Arabs and the Arab states in the 48 war, or what Israelis call the War of Independence. And that labor movement continued, Mapai continued under Ben-Gurion, the leader, uh, to rule Israel um, uh, um, into the 1960s. And uh, Ben-Gurion was succeeded in the early 1960s by one of his sidekicks, a man called Levi Eshkol, was actually quite a moderate uh, and successful politician. And he was prime minister of Israel in 1967. Um, And very reluctantly, uh, dragged or was dragged into war uh, against Egypt, Syria, and um, Jordan in that war, the six-day 1967 war. If you like, I can talk about the circumstances immediately leading to that war, if you like. We're in your hands, sir. Okay. Well, what happened was that as a result of the um, Israeli-Syrian tensions, and Israeli strikes against the Syrian air force and Syrian ground forces, as I say, because they were trying to divert the River Jordan and were being aggressive towards Israeli settlements on the Israeli side of the border. As a result of this, um, the Syrians feared that Israel was about to attack them um, uh, in a larger way, uh, getting tired of the guerrilla strikes instigated by the Syrians and tired of Syria's direct attacks on Israel. And the Syrians feared that they were going to be attacked. Um, In in about the 12th or 11th of May or the 13th of May, 1967, um, the the Russians entered the picture. The Russians were the main arms suppliers and political backers, both of Egypt under Gamal Abdel Nasser and the Syrian Ba'athist regime. They were the the, the international backers of these two um, um, nationalist um, um, Arab regimes, and the 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 Russians uh, on the twelfth of apparently on the twelfth thirteenth of May told the Syrians, told the Egyptians that the Israelis were about to attack Syria. Uh, as I say, in in uh, in reaction to various Syrian um, uh, misdemean- misdemeanors. Um, um, well, what happened then was that the uh, uh, Egyptians believed the Syrians, even though the Egyptians sent their chief of staff to Syria and uh, who looked over the border and said the, the Israelis are not preparing anything. And the Israelis uh, uh, told the, the um, um, uh, Russians uh, who heard about the Israelis heard about this and said to the Russians, send your ambassador to the border and check if we are actually massing our troops for an, a major attack or an invasion of Syria. But the Russians declined to send the ambassador. And and so Egypt's president, Nasser, um, um, uh, um, took the bait uh, for whatever reasons. We can go into that, if you like, in a second. And in the, on the 14th of May, began to send his armored divisions into the Sinai Peninsula. Now, the Sinai Peninsula... Um, um, had been invaded in 1956 by Israel, and uh, had then Israel had then with, withdrawn on condition that the peninsula, which borders on Israel's southern half, the Negev Desert, uh, um, on condition that the Egyptians demilitarize the Sinai Peninsula and install a UN force along the border on the Egyptian side of the border, UNIF, which would monitor the peace between Israel and Egypt. 
um, in May 1967, on the 14th, 15th of May 1967, the Egyptians sent their armored divisions into Sinai, remilitarizing re it and posing with six or seven divisions there, re um, uh, um, posing a threat to Israel's south which forced Israel to mobilize, because if it didn't mobilize, the Egyptian army, which would be bigger than the Israeli army, would be a standing threat uh, to invade Israel. So Israel mobilizes its army um, um, uh, after the 15th of May. The Egyptians, seeing that the Israelis don't do anything about it except mobilizing, but don't, um, uh, don't do anything, and they're they're being also restrained, the Israelis, by the Americans who say, wait, we'll solve the problem. Um, the Egyptians then order the United Nations to withdraw its um, um, peacekeeping force, UNIF, along the Israeli-Egyptian border. In other words, opening that border for Egyptian attack. Um, and the uh, United Nations complies and simply withdraws the UNIF forces out of Egypt and out of the Sinai Peninsula, out of the Gaza Strip, which is an extension of the, Gaza, of the Sinai Peninsula. The Egyptians see that Israel, the United Nations, are playing ball with them, uh, complying to their demand, and they see that the Israelis are still doing nothing. And on the 23rd of May, the Egyptians close the Straits of Tehran, which is Israel's exit into the Red Sea. Today, of course, another major flashpoint um, uh, of Arab-Israeli conflict, as we shall see, more or less caused by the same things. The Egyptians close the Straits, cutting off the Egyptian Israel's southern port, a lot. Uh, by air, also by sea, from any connection to the outside world, meaning to Asia, to Africa, and so on. Um, and, and this is a casus belli. It's the closure of an international waterway and choking Israel, something they had done before, which was one of the reasons Israel had invaded Sinai in 1956 in the Sinai-Suez War, because then also the Egyptians closed the waterway, both that waterway and the Suez Canal, to Israeli shipping. So the Egyptians close the, the, the straits, and then, of course, the Israeli army says, this is it. This is a casus belli. We have to move. We can't let Egypt choke us, as they're beginning to do. Israel's port city of Elath, one of the Middle East's hottest spots, following a blockade of the Gulf of Aqaba by the United Arab Republic. Ten years ago, Israel went to war over the same blockade, which cut off oil pipelines to Haifa refineries. Oil tankers and vital shipping arrive at this important city. The provocative war of nerves causes Israel to call up army reservists, ordering them to active duty to augment the regular 70,000-man Israeli armed force. Premier Levi Eshkol says Israel has no intention of attacking its Arab neighbors, calling for a mutual reduction of Arab-Israeli forces massed along the border. But taking no chances, Tank units go through battle maneuvers in the Negev desert. The Egyptians go a bit further than that, and on the 30th of May, they actually sign a defense pact with uh, Jordan and another one with Iraq, but the Jordanian one is the more important, in, in essentially subordinating the Jordanian army. This is uh, what Jordan's leader, King Hussein, does. He agrees to the subordination of the Jordanian army to Egyptian command and also allows several battalions of Egyptian um, um, uh, commandos to be, to move into Jordan to threaten, if you like, Israel also from the east, not just from the west, from the Sinai Peninsula. So Israel is beginning to feel constricted by this tightening hold led by Egypt, which is Egypt and Syria and Egypt, Jordan and Iraq um, from the east. And uh, the Israeli army is pressing uh, this uh, Israeli prime minister, Eshkol, who is a moderate and a very pragmatic type, doesn't want war. Uh, the Israeli general staff begins to press him. We must break out of this um, a vice being con uh, constructed around us by uh, Nasser. Nasser feels that he somehow won a major political victory by getting rid of the UN from Sinai, uh, reinvesting Sinai with his uh, army, uh, closing the straits. Maybe he thinks the Israelis are not going to do anything because the Americans who said they will open the straits haven't managed to do this. They were supposed to put together a flotilla, which again reminds us of current events down a bit further south in the Red Sea, um, uh, the Babel Mandeb Straits, where the Houthi Red 
rebels are now trying to restrict shipping to Israel. The, the Americans again uh, then tried to put together an international flotilla to open the straits, to pre which would prevent an Israeli uh, attack on Egypt. But the Americans don't manage to do that. The army persuades Eshkol, uh, the prime minister, that it must move. Uh, the longer we wait, the more powerful the Egyptian army will be entrenched, etc., in the Sinai Peninsula. Maybe they'll even attack us first. And whoever attacks first always has an advantage. Um, uh, and demands from Eshkol the right to attack. And Eshkol, after sounding out America, which changes its tune on the first days of June, um, uh, uh, instead of trying to restrain Israel, it basically gives Israel, it gives Israel a green light or at least an orange light uh, to go ahead. And the Israeli army launches its attack on Egypt on the morning of the 5th of uh, June 1967. Uh, as you say, basically destroying the Egyptian army, uh, air force, sorry, uh, the Egyptian Air Force uh, in two or three hours uh, basically uh, destroys some 400 planes on the ground um, within two or three hours, uh, totally destroying the Egyptian Air Force, which is the prelude to the ground invasion in which the Israeli, the Israeli army crushes the Egyptian armored divisions in Sinai within a few days. It's one of the most stunning military attacks since World War II. Incredibly successful. If you look at the, the physical size of the Egyptian air force, um, it would have it had the potential to overwhelm the small state of Israel, and in in a morning, it's lit literally wiped out, literally wiped out. Which then means that there's going to be no opposing air fire uh, with the advancing um, Israeli uh, mechanized mechanized brigades into S Sinai. But before we go into the detail. Of, of the war and i don't want to spend that long on it because i want to really deal with the political ramifications with the new bigger israel which is going to emerge in 1967 what that then means in terms of um geopolitically what that means for the palestinian people so i don't want a blow by blow account of the war though we need to step through it um mitch uh, but really briefly, though, Mitch, because uh, we want to get to the war and then uh, the aftermath of the war. Nasser was a lion of Arab nationalism, and and maybe this is the last time. And and you've and you've kind of given us this. This is the last time when there was a real sense of real Arab unity. You've explained that technically, notionally. Um, Egypt, Syria, and Yemen were the same country. Um, but it was more of a badge of convenience. Uh, but just tell us a little bit about Nasser, because he was really a, a man of his time and very much an Arab nationalist. But just give us just two minutes on Nas Nasser, and then we'll deal with the prongs of attack of the Israeli uh, war. I, I think actually the union of, of Egypt and Syria uh, broke up before the war. I think the Syrians uh, uh, thought the Egyptians were too uppity and taking over key posts. And so the Syrians basically that 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 joint sort of Arab community, which would you know be the sort of the beginnings, the incipient beginnings of a larger Arab state that sort of fell apart formally informally they still saw themselves as arabs i mean one can deny you know a a unifying identity despite the growing uh uh, uh identities of 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 nation states um but but nasser um my understanding is and that that i mean actually perhaps there is a debate about this that nasser um was this charismatic leader that you know really um uh um uh, 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 really excited uh, the Arab populace, uh, not only in the countries involved, but throughout the the Arab world. You know the the like sort of the protests. You know on on October seventh and eighth, uh, where they were celebrating. Um, I think you know you see this great celebration in the Egyptian uh, uh, and Arab uh, capitals and cities, oftentimes in in states that don't allow. Uh, random protests. Um, but my understanding is, is that Nasser, uh, that there's an argument that Nasser sort of wanted to bluff, that it was the chief of the army, Amir, who was really keen on attacking Israel. Um, and to some extent, the removal uh, 
of the uh, UN troops uh, dividing Egypt from Israel uh, surprised Nasser. Uh, because you remember, what, wh why were they there? They were there precisely for this reason. They were an excuse not to do anything from the Egyptian side. Um, however, once they leave, you don't have that wall anymore of the UN to go through. Um, but, but Nasser, and also I think there's an argument that Nasser really pushed uh, Hussein. Uh, there was a conflict before between Nasser and Hussein. Um, it's too King complicated to get in here. Pardon yeah. me? Uh, King, King Hussein of Jordan. King Hussein of Jordan. Um, and King Hussein of Jordan, who had sort of backdoor ties to Israel um, in, in a way that Egypt didn't. Egypt did a little bit too, but not to the extent of Jordan. That uh, the, the King Hussein didn't think that they were ready um, and was sort of forced by the popular pressure sort of from below, as well as from the Arab states. You remember, there is an Arab League. Uh, these people see themselves as Arab leaders, and they, and they see Israel as an enemy and a thorn in the side of all of them. And to sort of reluctantly, Hussein sort of gives control of the, his army to Nasser. And that might cause problems in and of itself. Um, but, uh, you know, NASA really saw this, or at least advertised the unified sort of Arab nature of this discussion and how they would be victorious. And this would actually reverse uh, the uh, uh, um, um, shame of the loss in 48 and to some extent in 56. Uh, and um, uh, but to what extent uh, Nasser really wanted to invade uh, or not, or would invade it anyway if Israel didn't strike first? Uh, because from Israel's perspective, and Benny Morris can you know, confirm this, my understanding is is that uh, the, certainly the populace was scared as shit that there was going to be another Holocaust. Uh, afraid in a way that I don't think Americans or West Europeans can imagine these days. Um, and uh, the leadership, um, you know, saw what was happening. Uh, and uh, there was a real threat. There was a change. Egyptian troops were in the Sinai ready to attack in a way that they weren't. They were armed by Russia. And I'll just end uh, um um, by saying that it wasn't just Egypt, remember. Uh, Israel at that time was under siege. There's this great book by Conor Cruz O'Brien called The Siege, A History of Israel. Um, and this is a world in which uh, is forgotten today. And so you have to sort of understand the Israeli perspective. Uh, and I, I hope Benny Morris can either elaborate or, or disabuse me of something that I have totally incorrect uh benny yes you no, no, what you're, yeah sorry uh, yeah, after you sir um uh, no what you're saying is certainly correct there, there was a general feeling of a, a constriction strangulation in fact a, which is a tightening of the siege which basically had existed since 1948-49 um there was a sense in some of the israeli public that maybe even the Egyptians and the, their, their, their allies could, if they went to war, beat Israel. Uh, they were even preparing uh, mass graveyards in parks in Tel Aviv uh, in anticipation of large Israeli casualties when the war erupted, if Egypt should strike uh, first. Um, the army wasn't uh, of this mind. The Israeli army knew that it would win and win quickly, uh, so it believed if it was allowed to strike first. And the CIA uh, pr produced exactly the same uh, results uh, for the war in its uh, uh, assessments of what would happen. But the public in Israel, uh, in some uh, sense, had a great fear of this impending war. Um, uh, this is certainly true in the days leading up to the 5th of June. The th one thing I want to make a, 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 a stress, and this is usually forgotten, 
um, by everyone who condemns Israel for occupying uh, the West Bank and what followed afterwards, occupying the Palestinian population uh, of the West Bank and so on. On the morning of um, uh, June 5th, Israel attacked the Egyptian Air Force and it drove its armored divisions into Sinai, attacking the Egyptian army. But it also sent a message at the very moment, more or less, of attacking the Egyptian Air Force. It sent a message through the United Nations to King Hussein of Jordan saying, you don't open fire, we will not touch you or your army in the West Bank or in East Jerusalem. Don't shoot. We won't fight you. We'll fight only the Egyptians. Um, and once the uh, Jordanians... Uh, as um, um, Mitch was saying, partly under stress of their public opinion and of their Arab allies that they should do something to help the Egyptians, once they started shooting into West Jerusalem, into the Jewish part of Jerusalem and to the outskirts of uh, Tel Aviv, Israel again sent a message around noon, stop shooting and we won't touch you. And the Jordanians nonetheless continued firing, and at this point the Israelis began to fire back, then move into Jerusalem, then within three days conquered the rest of the West Bank, smashing the Jordanian army after the same as they did to the Egyptians, destroying the Jordanian air force, which was very small, on the ground. This happened with the, on the Jordanian front, and with the war ending with Israel in occupation of the West Bank, something that had not been, a, a, it had not prepared, it had not conceived would happen, a, but that's a, what happened. The same thing more or less happened on the Syrian front. The Syrians, with their Russian allies who had provoked the war, a, actually began to shoot at Israel, wasn't attacked by Israel, but began to the shoot at Israel's border settlements at the same time as the Jordanians opened up um, a, against Israel um, uh, that uh, morning afternoon of June 5th, and Israel uh, uh, ended the war essentially by conquering the Golan Heights from Syria, ending up in occupation of a small chunk of Syria uh, by the end of the war. But it's and worth that... remember remembering that, that the war Israel launched preemptively was directed against Egypt and the threat from Egypt, not against the Jordanians and not even against uh, the, the Syrians who had, had actually provoked this whole chain of uh, events. And it's important in terms of to understand the security that the Golan Heights is going to give uh, Israel uh, security, which uh, it could only ever dream of in terms of the kind of Lake Galilee region, because as it said, it's the heights, it's the ground which commands the northeastern passage into Israel. So we have this stunning victory, which happens in, in, in six days. And one of the things which is going to happen uh, is that uh, Israel now um, has millions uh, of Palestinians um, under its kind of under its control. Uh, the the Kingdom of Jordan is effectively cut in two, and many uh, you know so R Ramallah, Nablus, etc. Now are under the control of Israel. Um, Egypt has given a thorough blood, bloody nose and NASA is going to offer to step down, but but he actually doesn't. People say And Israel it. now controls the Gaza Strip, which yes, is of course, chock full of, course. of Palestinians as well. So we have the Absolutely. Western Palestinians and the Gaza Palestinians, in addition to Israel's Arab minority, which is also a chunk, a small chunk of Palestinians, all of them are now under Israeli control. Absolutely. And even a few Syrian villages up there in, in the Golden Heights. And not, not, not a lot of people, but yes, 100%. How does this stunning victory change the, uh, the Israeli geopolitical calculus? There are many people who are under their control, under Israeli control, who are not Jewish. How does that immediately change things? And that's before we get to the worldwide condemnation that actually UN Resolution 242, that Israel should withdraw. How does that change things in Israel? Well, firstly, there isn't UN condemnation. The, Israel, the UN uh, uh, Security is a balanced resolution which says countries should not uh, take over the territory of other countries by force, but at the same time, it basically, so in other words, implying Israel should withdraw from the conquered territories, but only in, ex in exchange for peace with the Arab states, 
peace with those states which had never agreed to Israel during the previous 20 years. So now it's saying to the Arab states, you can have back your territory if you make peace with Israel and end the conflict with Israel. That, that's to do with the, the, the um, um, United Nations resolution, which is important. But the, the importance of the Six-Day War lies in a number of, a number of things. For, firstly, it shows that Israel has emerged as a dominant military power in the Middle East. Uh, the Egyptians may brag and boast and threaten and the Syri with the Syrians and the uh, Jordanians and the Iraqis, they can do a lot of rhetoric and talk. You know, they can talk the talk, but they can't actually walk the walk. Or it's even worse than that. They are t terribly humiliated. And this is ex extremely important. In other words, the humiliation of losing the 48th war is now compounded by a smaller humiliation in losing the 56th war between Israel and Egypt, which the Egyptians could say, well, it was the British and the French who beat us there, not the Israelis. But in 67, even though they tried to say the Americans, and NASA lies about this, the Americans helped the Israelis. It's total nonsense. Everybody knows that. It was the Israelis who defeated the Egyptians and then successively the Jordanians and Syrians um, all by itself. And now Israel is the dominant military power there. And this humiliation is really something awful for the Arab world. Um, it leads Nasser, as you say, to resign, though he, of course, arranges mass demonstrations in the streets of Cairo to call him back not to resign. And he doesn't resign, but he does end up a broken man and dies of a heart attack three years later, probably produced partly by this uh, enormous Israeli victory uh, in 67. But geopolitically, it changes the reason, re region. Um, apart from uh, to, uh, showing that Israel is the dominant military power, it shows that uh, um, the Arab states are basically um, paper tigers, including Nasser, who was boasting throughout that he would be the great Arab leader who would bring victory to the Arab nation against the Jews. Um, but it also uh, subordinates the Palestinians to Israeli rule. In other words, the, those uh, Palestinians, who had been beaten and many of them had been become refugees in 1948 now are under total Israeli control and uh, th this also changes the geopolitics and leads to a rise a reawakening of Palestinian nationalism something which had died in 48 Palestinians were basically under Jordanian and Egyptian uh, control in the Gaza Strip and in the West Bank. Now they were all under Israeli control and this triggers a reawakening of Palestinian nationalism. Mitch, um, what does this do, uh, just briefly, Mitch, uh, what does this do to King Hussein and the Jordanian state? Uh, because there's this key defining thing, you know, are the Jordanians Palestinian uh, be beforehand, etc. And and I think you and Benny are really painting this picture, whereas Hussein didn't actually really want to get involved in this, but felt he had to because of a groundswell of Arab opinion. The battle was waged against us mainly from the air, almost exclusively from the air, with such overwhelming strength and continued sustained air attack on every single unit, on every single formation of our armed forces, day and night, right till last night. What happens to the uh, Jordanian state if literally half of it now becomes uh, under Israeli occupation? How does that change the way that it sees um, its identity and its relationship with the PLO? Uh, that's a great question. I think Benny brings up an important point about sort of the, um, the renewed sort of emphasis among the Palestinians that they are distinct. They are not Jordanians. They are a distinct nation. Uh, although some might have Jordanian citizenship. Um, and some scholars basically argue, um, and I don't think it's clear cut that you had uh, an Arab-Israeli conflict until 67, and some people, uh, or 73, and some people say then you have an Israeli-Palestinian. I think, I think they're blurred, uh, but what happens in Jordan? 
what happens in Jordan is you have more Palestinian refugees uh, who leave for whatever reason uh, the West Bank into into uh, across into across the the, uh, the Jordan River into uh, Jordan proper, the East Bank of the Jordan River, and eventually you have the Palestinian sort of revived notion of a Palestinian national movement uh, rear its head up and. Um, really uh, uh, um, creates a situation in which the Palestinians become sort of a separate pseudo state within Jordan, which leads to a conflict eventually, I think it's in 1970, Black September, between the Palestinians and the Jordanians, um, uh, in which uh, the Jordanians uh, uh, are victorious, um, I don't know to what extent the Pakistanis helped. And the PLO is exiled to Lebanon, where you begin to see a shift in Lebanon. So you have a much more precarious situation for King Hussein as a Hashemite king. You remember the Hashemites are from the Hejaz, uh, are from Mecca, which is hundreds of miles south of where Jordan is. Jordan was a, a completely artificial creation. Um, and you have greater tensions between Palestinians and Jordanians. And you have Palestinians begin to say, look, we can't rely on Arab states to basically uh, uh, free uh, occupied Palestine. Uh, we must do it ourselves. Uh, maybe, okay. maybe and, I, can, I add, can I add something to this? Um, following the, the, the victory over the Arab states in 67 by Israel, the Palestinian national movement led by what the Palestine Liberation Organization, which is essentially a Fatah creation, if, which emerges in 1964, the Palestinians reached the conclusion that their salvation won't come from the Arab states. They've obviously shown that they're paper tigers. Either they don't want to fight Israel or they're unable to fight Israel. And so uh, the PLO turns into a major um, guerrilla resistance movement with bases in Jordan. The Jordanians accept them, their bases in uh, J Jordan, uh, east of the river, and the PLO grows in power inside Jordan. And this power over 67, 69, turns into a major threat to the Jordanian regime itself, eventually leading to, leading to a civil war inside Jordan between the PLO forces and the Jordanian army, which the Jordanian army in so-called Black September 1970 destroys the PLO, pushing it out to Lebanon. The PLO reinvests itself and reemerges in Lebanon, there also destabilizing the Lebanese state causing a civil war inside Lebanon and Israeli-Lebanese clashes along the border because of the PLO incursions into Israel from Lebanon. But this is following 69-70, their ouster from uh, um, Jordan. Let, let's go back to Israel post the Six Days War. There are There is the West Bank, there is Gaza, was there a sense that these areas were going to be occupied permanently or did Israelis think this is a temporary thing uh, and we're going to let these areas go eventually? What We oh, know okay. what's <laughs> happened, but what did people think back in 1967 in the immediate okay. aftermath? Im immediately after the conquest of the area, a few Israeli intellectuals said we must not continue in our occupation of this people. We can't rule over another people, the Palestinians of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. This is immoral. It won't be able to last. We won't be able to manage it. It'll be, it'll demoralize and corrupt Israel itself. That's a small minority of Israelis. Most Israelis think in terms of, A, this will provide us continuing Israeli occupation of the West Bank, will provide us with security against a reemergence of Palestinian guerrillas in the West Bank will attack Israel. So we must stay there in terms of Israeli security, at least in the immediate sense. In the Israeli political arena, the parties can't really decide what to do about the West Bank. 
on the uh, and and the Gaza Strip on the 19th of June, two uh, ten days more or less after the end of the Six Day War, on the 19th of June 1967, in a secret session, not publicized, the Israeli cabinet. Uh, decides that it that Israel is willing to withdraw from the Sinai Peninsula and to withdraw from the Golan Heights in exchange for peace with Egypt and with Syria if these areas are demilitarized. In other words, Israel will get peace from these two major Arab neighbors uh, and it will give up the territory it had just conquered. In other words, these territories are seen as cards in Israel's hands for which they can get peace from the Arab states, which until then had refused to give Israel peace. But the cabinet was unable in on the 19th of June, 1967, to agree about what to do with the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. That is, it was unwilling to uh, decide. There was no majority to withdraw or to hand back these territories to Egypt and um, uh, um, uh, the Jordanians. Um, because some of the cabinet ministers wanted to annex the territory. Some wanted to keep it for historical and other reasons, strategic reasons, it, especially the West Bank and East Jerusalem, to keep them for historical and strategic reasons. Um, and a small minority maybe wanted to give them back in exchange for peace, but they were unable to get a, ma a majority vote in cabinet. And therefore, the areas uh, by default remained in Israeli hands. And the occupation has gone on in some way or other for the past 50 years since 1967 yes. so 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 strategically israel didn't um, set out to capture and keep the these areas but uh, there was somewhat of a a model as to what to do with them but in terms of definitely the west bank and gaza in terms of the security for israel proper they were seen as as vital that at least it held, held on to them though it didn't didn't start the war necessarily with that uh, goal in in mind um one of the things which is really marked definitely in the West Bank today is going to be Israeli settlements. And as according to, to the UN and to the, to the majority of the world opinion, this is Palestinian land and this occupation is illegal. And there's UN resolutions about it, etc. The US government, it's their stated policy that this is Palestinian land and there shouldn't be Israeli settlers. When do the settlers start to move into and i know them also do move in into gaza and actually sinai as well but when do they move into the west bank within two weeks of the conquest of the west bank within two wow. weeks two three weeks and what happens is the children of israeli settlers who had lived in the west bank prior to 1948 and had been conquered by the J jordanian army and their settler settlements had been destroyed the etzion block had been destroyed by the Jordanian army in May 1948. Their children now want to go back and settle in the area of the West Bank, the Southern West Bank, um, uh, immediately after the Israeli conquest. Side by side with those settler children, there is also the growth of a messianic movement, which begins at that point by religious nationalist, religious Jews who say, well, this is this is a God-given miracle. God wanted us to return to the main sites of Jewish sovereignty two, 3,000 years ago. This is the historic core of the Jewish state under David and Solomon, etc., etc. And we now have the chance to return to there and to uh, keep it forever, basically to annex the territory. This is our ancient homeland, the core of our ancient homeland. And this settlement movement, this convergence of messianic settlers and these returnees, if you like, to the territory, they begin a vast settlement enterprise, basically cowing the Israeli government, which is still labor-led, led by the Israeli labor movement until 1977, but they are cowed into acceding to a growing number of settlements and settlers in the West Bank, and as you say, also in the Gaza Strip as well, which is part of historic uh, Palestine or the historic kingdom of uh, Israel under David and Solomon. There's a wonderful photograph of Israeli troops looking at the Western Wall, the, the, the Wailing Wall, and, and they look kind by of David Rubinger. Wall. David Rubinger is the famous photographer. Yes, 
it, it, it is um, utterly um, iconic and you get the real sense of the achievement of not only the Israeli army, but the, but the Jewish people um, that 2000 years and they have gone back to uh, the, the remnants of, of the temple, which was destroyed by the Romans. It, it, it's, an, it's an amazing uh, photograph. We're going to have the Yom Kippur War, and we need to deal with that in maybe a, a, another show. But um, we, we've we've talked about the PLO, and we've talked about Black September in, in Jordan, and the fact that the PLO now is is the main uh, spear of the the war against Israel. That uh, and they've kind of almost given up um, relying on. Arab states, though there is going to be the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Uh, and we've talked about Israeli domestic politics, how, how that changes. Is there, a, is, is there a sense that the Six Days War, from the Israeli perspective, is a second war of independence? Because, as you, as you said, Benny, that the Israel, Israel now is the clearly the dominant military player in, in the region would that be fairly safe to say that you know the 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 continuance of the israeli state is no longer in question because of the six days war i i suppose that's a fair judgment that is it to me establishes israel more solidly in, uh, uh, in in the territory and as you say expands the territory um um I, I I wouldn't call it a second war of independence, though. I would say the second war of independence is probably the war we're engaged in now, with its ramifications, if with Yemen and the the, the Iranians and the Hezbollah in the north uh, and the West Bank uh, problem. Uh, we're now engaged in some sort of second war of independence. That's my view of what has happened. Uh, but the Six Day War simply reestablishes Israel as a much stronger power. Uh, and both strengthens, strengthens and, as it turns out, weakens Israel at the same time because of the occupation of the Palestinians. Um, it does both things at the same time. That's an interesting perspective, isn't it, Mitch, that, that Benny said that it strengthens Israel and also weakens Israel. And, you know, I, I always say I fervently believe in, in a Palestinian state, but not to the detriment of an Israeli state. I think the two need to uh live alongside each other um would you share that conclusion as well that actually what this does is not only strengthen israel but in a way actually weaken israel the fact that it now has to have some level of permanent occupation of millions of people who aren't not only israeli aren't jewish yeah i think um you know in the aftermath of the 67 war you have a a more a, a growing sort of segment of of religious Zionism. Um, I mean, if you look at the the cabinet, the leaders of 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 Israel in the aftermath of 1970 uh, in the 1967 war, uh, their emphasis is on security. Uh, I mean, what else? I mean, uh, uh, Benny mentions uh, uh, the Etzion block um, uh, returning, and that's sort of a, a around Jerusalem. Importantly, one of the first places that uh, that you know Israel annexes is Latrun Salient, and that tells you everything about the security issue, uh, because that was a thorn in the side of the Haganah and the um, uh, uh, early Israeli army in 1948 when they tried over and over again to conquer Latrun. And the three villages in that Lutrun salient are are exiled. Um, but it becomes a <clears throat> um, it transforms from a security issue about the West Bank into a greater sort of uh, religious Jewish uh, uh, issue. I mean, there's a term it I, I I I forget it um, in which you have people, and I think the early settlers in Hebron. Gush Emunim, uh, were not initially uh, uh, allowed to settle in the middle of Hebron, that uh, they did, and it was sort of a fait accompli. Uh, that, that was not, I think, that, for example, Yiga Alon's famous plan 
for the West Bank, which is all about security, uh, which is, look, Israel sort of controls most of the borders with Jordan, uh, some other places. Um, but on the whole, the the bulk of the Palestinians remain some sort of independent, connected with Jordan or autonomous in some ways. And you see this transformation to a settlement project where people try to settle the land. And one book which describes the question you asked, it's called A Cursed Victory, which I think encapsulates what you what you asked, um, you know. You know, I, as an historian, you know, I, 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 you know, you have something which happened, um, you know, and, you know, whether it's good or bad, who knows what would have happened otherwise. I think in the end, which those who insist on annexing the West Bank have to deal with the Palestinian issue. And if you, you have two choices, you either annex them, okay, or you have a state in which you have uh, citizens and non-citizens. Now, that's typical for Qatar or UAE, which has 10 foreign workers to every sort of, you know, UAE citizen or Qatari citizen, and the foreigners are not allowed to be citizens, even if they're born there. Um, and that really sort of, sorry, changes the situation. And that sort of changes the situation. And, um, you know, you have to this is why um, uh, I am in favor of the two-state solution. If it can uh, uh, remain as a realistic option, um, and for it to remain a realistic ox uh, option, I think Israelis uh, uh, can't start settling all of the West Bank to prevent the possibility. And I think perhaps to some extent that you have greater and greater West Bank settlements who are there not necessarily for security reasons, like the conquest and annexation of the true salient, the, the true salient, um, but for messianic reasons or for other sort of nationalistic reasons, will inevitably cause a problem that is um, uh, in, insolvable, other than a two-state solution, um, and and that makes it difficult because. It's hard to have a two-state solution from the Israeli perspective if you have the potential state uh, um, uh, uh, um, with the motivation of destroying the Israel state, what the Palestinians, many Palestinians, uh, think is also occupied and is occupied by settlers. They call it the 48 Palestine. Hmm. Um, I, I think, uh, gentlemen, uh, we're just about at, at, at the end of the period that, that I wanted to cover. But Benny, being as you are our, our, our rock star here, you're our guest, guest of honour, um, is there anything which you feel that uh, we've missed out or if there is anything which is germane uh, that you just like, want to add or maybe end with? I, I would just add, and this is looking forward to the 1973 war, that the humiliation of the Arab states, uh, the main Arab states, uh, Egypt uh, and and uh, Syria, um, creates a, a strong revanchist drive within them. They must re re regain their honor, their self-respect by going to war. And if th not through diplomacy, through war, regain these territories they had lost to Israel. And this will bring us to the 1973 war. Yes. And I think also what, what, what's stunning, if you look at what Egypt does, that Egypt goes into that war for honor and within five years is going to come to a peace with Israel. So yes. it shows you that just because a war starts doesn't mean that people aren't actually thinking uh, past the end game. Uh, and it shows you really what the Egyptian um, intention was in, in, in the Yom Kippur War. Uh, well, at least, in, at least on the part of Sadat. The president yes. of Egypt. Yes, Anwar Sadat, yes, 100%. Uh, uh, yeah. but, he, but he's managed without a, spot, a plot spoiler for, for our, our next talk, but he manages to take the Egyptian military with him. And to the, to, to, to this day, that fundamental peace has as maintained between Egypt and Israel. But that's a conversation for another time. Professor Benny Morris, uh, thank you for coming on to Mid-Atlantic uh, for a second time.
My um, just, just, just very quickly, sir. Um, are you writing anything at the moment? Are you involved in anything which you'd like to uh, pimp and promote and tell our listeners and our YouTube viewers about? Not at the moment, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mitch, uh, my good friend, how about you, sir? Uh, maybe you can give people a, a URL of maybe where they can find your works. Uh, Mitch Newmark, over to you, sir. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, some of the, the, the best are, are not available online, um, uh, but you can you can find some of my work if you go to academia.edu. Um, um, but in terms of what I'm doing, I'm trying to uh, uh, recover as much as possible and uh, raise money for these surgeries that I have to under, undergo. And unfortunately, uh, there's so much, I mean, if, if Benny would understand this you spend years and years and years in the archives doing research and i have like a hundred box of books of notes um and uh, uh i'm just dying for the opportunity to get back to writing um uh, because uh, i have so much more to write uh and about jewish history um and about the history of the idea of religion and how notions of religions have changed um and uh, I look forward to that, but that comes after a very long and very uh, difficult uh, recovery uh, process and many surgeries, which I don't look forward to, except for it's necessary to move forward. Uh, we wish you uh, God's uh, speed in terms Same of here. Uh, Same a here. return to health. Uh, my good friend what we'll do we'll also put a link in the show notes uh, for your gofundme so um, if you are listening to this or watching this and you'd like to contribute to uh, professor newmark's recovery there's a link in in the show notes for that um this has been um you know i, I love talking to historians I'm, I'm a fan of history and as i said in, in our first conversation with Professor Benny Morris, it was actually The Six Days War was literally one of the first books that, that, that I read. I think I was of age about 10. And I just fell in love with the dynamism of the Israel, Israeli army, but also with the plight of the Palestinian people. You can appreciate uh, the two things at once. I think we're sophisticated enough to understand that we have a people, the Jewish people, who a generation before have come out of um, not a pogrom, genocide, where six million of them were slaughtered on an industrial level in Europe and have found refuge in this land. But that doesn't then uh, take away from the fact that there were many millions of people who were living in that land before who then found themselves dispossessed. And at the age of 10, I, I understood the tragedy of both sides that... Um, we have um, a, a set of people who call themselves Arabs, um, who were who were attached to that land and then found themselves dispossessed. And at the age of 10, I had sympathy with both sides. And that hasn't changed. And I'm now 55. Um, I do fervently believe that the Palestinian people do deserve a viable state somewhere which they can call home somewhere where they can raise their own flag and have their own customs and traditions and importantly security and i fervently do believe that when there is a viable peace for the palestinian people the israeli state will then also have peace and the and, and I think it was really telling what uh, Professor Benny Morris said that the Six Days War makes Israel stronger, but also weaker as well because permanently it has millions of people who are not Israeli citizens um, under its control, and it permanently it has to keep an eye on these people who, understandably, are angry that they don't have a viable state of their own. On that note, you can send me an email at royfield at gmail.com, R-O-I-F-I-E-L-D at gmail.com. And maybe you can respond to some of the things we talked about in this episode. Yes, it's been from the Israeli perspective, but I've kind of subtly tried to remind everybody of the Palestinian perspective. But we had two great historians with us, uh, one Jewish, one American Jewish, and one um, Israeli. 
So, Professor Benny Morris, thank you for coming on to the show. Professor Mitchell Newmark, uh, thank you for joining us, my my friend. Uh, Don't forget, if you listen to the podcast, we're now also on YouTube. If you want to see how bald and how grey I am, please head over onto YouTube. Type in Mid-Atlantic Podcast into YouTube and then you'll find the channel. Please then subscribe please watch the videos too um I, i'm very proud of the, the content which we're putting up there but please subscribe also write us a review on apple Podcasts. incredibly important uh, there's a new way of getting new listeners onto the show i will continue to do my bit by having interesting informed uh, guests please do your bit help me out however you can uh, don't forget there's going to be a link to professor newmark's go fund me in the uh, show notes and also on on youtube if you would like to go along and help him take care look after yourselves bye bye